So hello everyone, uh, this is Rodrigo Worley, Cropping System Specialist at the West Central Research and Extension Center. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, weed control and grain sorghum and also provide some information on herbicide uh, resistant weeds in Nebraska. Before I get started here, I would like to give credit to my co-author Cody Creech. Uh, Cody Creech is a dryland cropping system specialist in the Panhandle uh, Research and Extension Center and he helped me put these slides together. I'm also, I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Phil Stallman from Kansas State University. Uh, Dr. Stallman provided uh, some uh, slides and images that I'm going to be sharing uh, during this presentation. So sorghum control, uh, the, the first five weeks uh, in establishment of the crop is crucial uh, that you keep the crop weed free. Uh, sorghum does not compete uh, very well with the weeds early in the season, so again it's important you have uh, that clean start and your losses from in interference, you know, early in the season and throughout the season may range from, you know, your losses from anywhere from 30 to 50 percent and also some uh, crop failure here, as you can see uh, in some of those uh, pictures here, where you're not be able to kind of harvest much. Uh, there are some herbicide options uh, for, you know, broad spectrum weed control and grain sorghum. Uh, the biggest challenges when it comes down to grain sorghum is managing shatter cane and Johnson grass. Uh, these two species are the same species, you know, the same uh, genus as sorghum. So selecting a sorghum species uh, and sorghum is very challenging. Uh, and the other challenge when it comes down to weed management in grain sorghum is post-emergence grass control. Uh, as of now, there are no options uh, for post-emergence grass control, so it is important that you take advantage of freeze uh, uh, for that. An update on resistance, uh, as you can see here, uh, resistance has gained a lot of attention in the past uh, few years, but one thing that I want to point out is that resistance has been happening for a long, long time. Uh, the first cases of resistance were in the, uh, you know, uh, mid-60s uh, to, to atrazines. You know, atrazine became available. We start overusing it. We start seeing resistance. A few years later, ALS herbicides become available. Uh, we start using our group two or ALS herbicides a little more than what we should, and this is what we happens. We start seeing more and more resistance. Uh, years down the road, glyphosate-resistant crops become available. Uh, we then start using glyphosate a lot for our weed control programs, and this is what we're seeing now. So resistance is something that's been happening uh, for, for many, many years now. The problem is that, you know, every so often we had new tools coming uh, to, you know, becoming available to producers. That hasn't been the case anymore. Uh, the last mode of action or site of action to become available uh, were the HPPD inhibitors, and they came out in the early 80s there. So it's been about, you know, it's been about 30 years since we last had a new site of action. Uh, you know, the cases of weed resistance continue to increase, and that's, that's a big challenge that we're faced with now uh, when it comes down to weed uh, management. This is just an update of the herbicide resistant cases. Uh, in Nebraska, uh, common water hemp is a big weed problem uh, in the state, has evolved resistance to uh, five different sites of action, you know, uh, the ALS herbicides, uh, the growth regulators, atrazine, glyphosate, and also to HPPD inhibitors. So water hemp has become a big problem. Palmer amaranth is another species that's becoming uh, difficult to control in our row crops. Uh, Palmer emirate in the state of Nebraska has evolved resistance to the ALS herbicides, to atrazine, glyphosate, and also to HPPD inhibitors. Uh, another species that's also concerning is kochia. Uh, kochia has also evolved resistance to ALS herbicides, uh, to growth regulators, your dicamba, your 2,4-D, atrazine, and uh, glyphosate. So I would say these are probably, you know, one of the, the, the three most concerning uh, species. And then we also have mare's tail, which has evolved resistance to ALS herbicides or your group twos, and also uh, glyphosate. So combined, these are probably the, the four worst weeds uh, we're dealing with. When it comes down to sorghum production, uh, kochia seems to be a big problem, and also the pigweeds, both uh, calm water hemp and palmer emerald. So th those are some of the weeds uh, to keep an eye on. This last summer, summer of 2016, I conducted a survey uh, with soybean uh, producers. Uh, I interviewed more than 290 producers, and one of the questions that I asked them is whether they have 
uh, glyphosate resistant weeds and their properties. And according to 94% of our participants, they do believe they have uh, glyphosate resistance taking place in their operations. Uh, so about 70% of them believe they have glyphosate resistant water hemp and glyphosate resistant uh, mare's tail. Uh, Palmer emirate also seems to be uh, a problem out there. 21% of survey participants reported that they believe to have glyphosate resistant Palmer emirate uh, in their operation and then giant ragweed and kosher also came up as uh, common answers there. I didn't ask them whether uh, they believe they were dealing with more than one glyphosate resistant species and actually 70% of them reported that they're currently struggling with two or more glyphosate resistant weeds uh, in their operations. And common answers there were typically Meristail and Waterham or Meristail and Palmer Amaranth. Uh, so here you are dealing with a winter annual weed and a summer annual weed. Uh, this winter annual weed, Meristail, comes up in the fall. Uh, Palmer Amaranth kind of emerges uh, from May all the way through August. So you have weeds emerging at two completely different times. So it's important to point out that if you have the two uh, species present in your operation, you're basically dealing with two different bees. One that comes up early, uh, late fall, early spring, and the other one that's going to be coming up through the summer. So try to use the same management strategy to control these two different, uh, you know, groups of weeds. It's not going to work uh, for you. I then asked participants whether they believed they had resistance to additional sites of action, and surprisingly, about 45% of them said they, they do believe they have uh, resistance to other sites of action uh, in their operation. And common answers there were Waterham, Maristeo, Kosha, and Palmer Emirate. They have evolved resistance to ALS herbicides. Uh, there were some reports of HPPD resistant Waterham, 2,4-D resistant Waterham, triazine resistant Kosha, dicamba resistant Kosha, and 2,4-D resistant Kosha. So this is uh, the summary that I obtained from producers. And you know, uh, UNL has confirmed uh, resistance to all the sites of action already. Uh, some of the different answers that we got there that UNL hasn't confirmed yet was HPPD resistant Maristale, 2,4-D resistant Maristale, and PPO resistant water hemp uh, and Palmer Amaranth. Uh, that hasn't been confirmed the university by the university yet. We're currently investigating, uh, you know, this possibility here. But one thing that I want to point out uh, is that, you know, oftentimes, you know, producers sometimes wait a, wait a little too long to put some of these chemicals out there. And when you wait a little too long, those chemicals are no longer as effective as they would have been if those weeds were small. So trying to spray your Maristale by the time they're bolting uh, with HPPDs and 2,4-D and so on and not getting good control, that does not necessarily mean you have a resistance issue. That might mean that you're just spraying a little too late. And the same is true when you use the group 14 or your PPO or your burning herbicides to control the pigweeds. If you wait too long, when those pigweeds are four or five inches or taller to spray, you might not obtain good control. And again, that doesn't mean you have resistance. It's just a timing uh, issue. So it's important to go out there and spray those weeds uh, when they're small, you know, four inches or less. Timing is extremely important. So when it comes down to managing herbicide resistance, I want to go through a few things that you want to keep in mind. You got to scout frequently. You got to know when your weeds are emerging, and you got to quickly identify the problematic areas. You got to go scout and treat them as soon as possible. You gotta, again, make your timely herbicide applications. We use your best control when they're small. Don't wait too long. You know, Palmer Amaranth during the summer is gonna be putting two inches a day. You know, if you have the chance to spray on Friday, but you may wait to spray on Monday, and then it rains and you don't get to that field until Wednesday, it's gonna be way too late. So spray them when they're small. Start clean. Uh, stay clean. That's extremely important. By the time you're planting, you don't want to have weeds standing out there. Okay, you want to start clean. You want to use residual products. You want to scout your field, and if you see weed flushes coming through, you want to spray them when they're, you know, when they're small. So you want to start clean. You want to stay clean until your canopy closure. You want to control weeds around field borders. You know, driving all over the state. It's clear that we're not doing that as, as much as we should. Uh, we're allowing weeds on the roadsides and ditches to flower and produce seeds. Those seeds, somehow, they're going to get into your field. So if you're not controlling the field borders, you have an influx of seeds coming in at the end of the season. And you can do as good as of a job keeping your field clean. But if the edges are not, you know, that's going to complicate things for you. 
you got to use all available tools, you know. Uh, we only have so many effective herbicides. As I told at the beginning of my presentation, we don't have a lot more coming. You know, we haven't had new sites of action. You communicate with industry. It's going to take some years until we see a new site of action come into market. So we got to make sure we use all our herbicides wisely. But we got to go beyond. We got to stop thinking that weed management, it's only done with herbicides. We got to use cultural strategies, you know. Uh, we, you know, tillage is a possibility, you know, where there's a fit there. You got to understand what's available, planting time, you know. What about delaying planting so you can start clean, you know, hit, kill the weeds before you plant, and so on and so forth. And at the end of the season, if you have a few weeds standing out in your field, why let them flower? Why not go out there, pull, and remove them from your field so then you don't have new seeds going into the seed bank? With the herbicide resistant weeds, there's got to be a zero uh, threshold or a zero tolerance as we talk about it. A single wheat this year might become 1,000 plants next year. So don't let that happen. Adopt the zero threshold, particularly if you're in a situation where fields are not overtaken by resistant weeds. You know, if you're in the, the initial stages of resistance there, if you have an operation that, you know, it's got the problem, but the problem is still at low levels, you know, don't let that, you know, get worse and worse you know eliminate that problem from the from the get-go here and use a robust herbicide programs you know uh you know commodity prices are not the best right now however this is not a good time to start cutting your herbicide program okay so we strongly encourage producers to keep using or you know or add more and more residual products uh to their program so then they avoid some of those you know problems with resistant weeds and then I always, always use at least two effective uh, modes of action per application because that's going to, you know, uh, significantly decrease the likelihood uh, for resistance evolution and also for survival of resistant weeds. So what is research saying uh, about herbicide mixtures? A uh, study conducted uh, in Canada showed that mixtures were as effective as not using herbicides at all. So what they did there, they looked at using rotation of herbicide, using one herbicide one year, another herbicide another year, or they used, or they look, or and they compared that with uh, using multiple effective herbicides every time, you know, herbicide application took place. And what they found there is that by using mixes, you decrease the likelihood of resistance evolution. Now, by only rotating and only using one mode of action at a time, that actually was not helpful. Uh, with resistance management and that's why we promote uh, you know uh, that mixtures or herbicide mixture should be used. Another study conducted uh, in Illinois showed that herbicide mixtures were string, strongly uh, linked with reduced resistance and what they found is that by using 2.5 modes of action per application growers were 83 times less likely to select for resistant weeds. So again, that's why it's so important to use multiple effective herbicides each and every time we go out there uh, to make an application. So herbicide programs uh, for uh, grain sorghum, uh, we got to keep in mind that weeds emerge at different times throughout the season. Again, you got to understand what weed species you are uh, struggling with. Kochia, for instance, is known as an early uh, emerger weed species. And by the time sorghum is being planted, green kochia better be controlled because after you plant, it's going to be a challenge. Okay, uh, this is just some pictures that I took uh, last year uh, in 2016. You know, March 9, we already had kochia um, uh, germinating. Okay, this is a crop watch article I just put out last Friday or February 23rd. Okay, so we're having this warm weather conditions in February here, and guess who is already emerging out there? So these are pictures that I took here in North Platte last week on February 21st. And here we have, you know, soil temperature above 39 Fahrenheit. 39 Fahrenheit is a threshold for kosher emergence. Kosher is already coming up. So this, you know, if the weather conditions, if you have nice warm conditions, again, air temperatures above 55, that's a good time to go out there, control your kosher. Okay. So that's the one thing to keep in mind. Now, if you're struggling with the pigweeds, pigweeds is another story. You know, they're going to start coming up in May and they're going to emerge through uh, late July and August. So you got to understand what are the weed species you have out there. Uh, do I have problems with grasses? Again, you know, there are not many options for post-emergence grass control. 
in sorghum as there is in corn. So if you have a problem with grasses, you know, you got to, you know, take advantage of your priest. So again, it's all it's very important that you understand your weed spectrum, and that's going to help you uh, make your decision when it comes down to herbicide programs. Here's just showing some data that I collected in Chita that we, my team collected uh, last year in 2016. Uh, and McCook, Nebraska, looking at the emergence pattern of Palmer emerald. And as you see here, Palmer started germinating late May and continued to germinate until, you know, July or so. So very wide uh, window of emergence. So again, it's important to keep that in mind. So sorghum weed control, it's important to start clean. Kosha and Maristay are the weeds that are up and running early in the season. So you got to go out there early and add your residual. Uh, don't try to wait to control them after the crop is planted because you're going to have a difficult time. Now by the time you're planting, uh, this is when water hemp and palmer amaranth will start germinating, okay? So that's a good point, good time here for you to be putting down a good residual program that's going to hopefully take care of this uh, pigweeds that are going to come, be coming at the same time your crop is getting established. And keep in mind, the first five weeks of sorghum establishment, the, sorg the crop is very sensitive to weed competition. So keeping the crop clean during the first five weeks is of extreme importance. After that, after sorghum takes off, it's quickly going to close the canopy and then the crop will start doing its job in terms of uh, weed suppression. This is just some pictures that I took at that study uh, down in McCook. Uh, those pictures that I have, you know, are showing soybeans here, but I think it, they helped me tell the story. Uh, this is where we did not have pre-emerge applied at planting. This is where we did have pre-emergence applied at planting. And I always, always show this uh, picture to producers and I asked them, where would you rather be? Okay, first, there's already yield loss taking place in here. Those weeds are already competing with your crop. And the second thing here is that trying to control this pigweed at this stage is going to be very difficult. Look at the number of nodes and leaves that this pigweed plant has already. So the options that are available at this point, what they're going to do, they're going to fry this top. However, they're not going to control those weeds because they're going to come back uh, at you. It's already too late. So here, showing you the importance of using a good soil residual uh, program. So what are the most uh, common herbicides in grain sorghum? Uh, atrazine is a foundation uh, for broadleaf weed control. Uh, you know, most programs for uh, weed management in grain sorghum rely on atrazine, so that's a very important tool uh, when it comes down uh, to weed management in grain sorghum. Uh, atrazine can be applied pre-plant, pre-emergence, or early post-emergence, and uh, producers cannot exceed the 2.5 pounds of active ingredient per acre uh, per year. So just keep that in mind. And to enhance grass control, atrazine is usually mixed with some other active ingredients such as uh, chlorocetamide, asmetolachlor, metolachlor, and so on. And again, that's gonna help producers with grass control. And it's important when you're using this group 15 or chlorocetamide herbicides to use uh, herbicide safe and sorghum seeds so then you decrease herbicide injury uh, on your crop, okay? Uh, this is some work uh, that we've been doing, uh, looking at water hemp response to atrazine uh, and also other soil applied herbicides. So we had three different soil applied herbicides that we tested. We tested atrazine, metribuzine, sufentrazone. Uh, most of the seeds of water hemp were collected in the eastern part of the state here. And what we wanted to see is what is the current response of those populations to the soil applied herbicides. And what we found there is that, you know, metribuzin and sofentrazone, which are soybean herbicides, did a very good job controlling all uh, water hemp populations we tested. Now you look at atrazine and then you compare it to control, uh, that's not very good news there. As you can see here, there is a lot of atrazine uh, populations out there that are coming through that atrazine treatment. We've been using atrazine for 40 years now and we've been relying on it so much that you know some of this uh, water hemp populations have become resistant to it. And that's why it's important to understand, you know, what do I have? Uh, is atrazine uh, still an effective tool in my operation or not? Because the answer to these questions will help you to select your herbicide programs as you move on. Some other herbicides that are commonly used. Uh, Lumax, it's a very uh, common herbicide used in grain sorghum. It's a three-way mixture. It contains atrazine, asmetolachlor, and mesotrion. 
uh, it's a good chemical. It's a good chemical for broadleaf weed control as well as grasses. Okay, uh, K State is research was actually responsible for this registration. They conducted three years of research in multiple locations until they were able to convince Syngenta uh, to register this product for, for use in grain sorghum. So it provides an excellent weed control. And the one thing we usually advise producers that if they're going to use Lumax, they recommend that you spray it at least seven days before uh, uh, planting your crop just to decrease the likelihood of crop uh, injury. Okay, and when planting the grain sorghum, it's important to close the furrow there, so then there is no uh, exposure of the seed or the seedling, direct exposure to the herbicide, because that might also cause uh, some injury there. Uh, some other options uh, for post-emergence control now uh, in grain sorghum. Uh, there's basically no post-emergence option that's effective. For grass control, there is an upcoming technology that might address some of that that I'm going to talk uh, more about towards the end of my presentation. But as of now, there are basically no options for grass control. So you got to take advantage of your pre-use, your group 15s, and uh, your HPPD inhibitors to help you with grass management there. Uh, for In terms of uh, post-emergence uh, weed control, broadleaf weed control, there are some good options. Uh, Husky is commonly used option out there. Uh, you know, it's a mixture of pyroxus fultol plus uh, moxinil. Uh, it's usually when you put in husky out there, it's recommended to add, you know, atrazine or 2,4-D to enhance uh, weed control. Uh, control several broadleaf weed species, including, you know, glyphosate resistant uh, weeds. So actually, you know, rotating, you know, uh, including sorghum in your crop rotation, kind of going away from glyphosate and taking advantage of this other modes of action might be a good strategy for uh, management of glyphosate resistant weeds. Uh, and then it's important to keep in mind that if you already use Lumax in the, in, you know, early in the season coming and using uh, Husky may increase the likelihood of injury. Okay. And that's because uh, Husky also contains an HPPD inhibitor, so using Lumax, which contains an HPPD inhibitor, and coming back with Husky, which also contains an HPPD inhibitor, that might increase uh, risk of crop injury. So just keep that in mind. These are some of the herbicide options that we have. Uh, if you need more information, just go to the 2017 Guide for Weed Management in Nebraska. This is where this information came from. Uh, these are some of the options that are going to help you to start clean. Uh, so you can use mixes. Uh, you know, glyphosate used to be an effective option, but because of glyphosate resistant kochia, if, if you have kochia, if you have glyphosate resistant kochia, you got to be adding something uh, out there for your, for your burn down, you know, to help you start clean. And the one thing that I want to point out here is that, you know, once we do start diversifying our programs, as we're recommending, the costs, they increase. But it is important it's important to invest in good weed control so then uh, you avoid that yield loss uh, later in the season and you also you know it will also help you management this this problem that continues to increase uh, when using 2,4-D or dicamba which are commonly used burn down strategies you gotta uh, you know respect the planting intervals there so if you're using uh, 2,4-D if you're using 16 ounces you gotta wait 10 days before planting. If you're using more than 16 uh, fluid ounces, you know, you got to wait at least 21 days till you plant. And then for dicamba, if you're using four fluid ounces per acre, uh, you got to wait seven days before planting. And if you're doing uh, eight ounces, you got to wait 10 days. So just respect uh, the planting intervals there so then you decrease uh, crop injury. In terms of pre-emergence, uh, these are the ones that have soil residual activity. Uh, we already talked, you know, atrazine is a foundation uh, for weed management and sorghum. Uh, Lumax, it's a, it's a good option. Uh, several producers have used it. Uh, Verdict is also a good option. You know, it goes away a little bit uh, from your HPPD. So if you want to use Husky in season for post-emergence control, you know, perhaps going away from HPPD and using something like Verdict that doesn't have an HPPD uh, active ingredient in the mix would be a, a good uh, alternative there. So just things to keep in mind. When it comes down to post-emergence, uh, your 2,4-Ds, your dicambas uh, are, are good options. And again, most of the herbicides are effective in broadleaf species and none of them are very effective uh, for grass control.
So new technologies for uh, grain sorghum, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, Enzen sorghum. It's not a genetically modified uh, trait. Uh, I'm just going to give you a, a brief history of, of this technology here. So in the mid-2000s, an ALS-resistant shatter cane population was detected in Kansas. And then scientists at Kansas State University, they crossed this ALS-resistant shatter cane population with grain sorghum. So they inserted the resistance gene from the weed, shatter cane, into the crop. Okay, uh, DuPont has then acquired the license of this herbicide tolerance gene from Kansas State and has branded the technology as Enzen. So every time, as I'm ref as every time I talk about Enzen sorghum, I'm talking about this ALS tolerant grain sorghum. Okay, and Enzen is going to be co marked with the herbicide Zast, which is basically uh, a nicosuferon herbicide or an axon uh, herbicide. Okay, it's a group two herbicide. Once this technology becomes available, producers will be able to spray zest post-emergence, and for the first time, they're going to have an effective tool uh, for grass control post-emergence here. These are some of the pictures that I took last summer of some of our plots. Uh, here we have in Zen Sorghum treated with 2,4-D and zest. As you can see, really good weed control, and this is where I could not uh, use zest. Okay, so this is a site where we have a very heavy pressure of grass species here. Bristly foxtail is the main species we have at this location. Uh, we did put a pre out, okay, but the pre only took care of so much, okay. And after the pre's residual was gone from the soil, you know, you had this flush of weeds coming through and post-emergence you have no option. So when you only two for this is uh, what we had there uh, at the end of July. So this is just to illustrate the potential of this technology. Uh, so applications for post-emergence grass control, uh, what studies have shown is that uh, zest should be sprayed at a rate of two-thirds to an ounce per acre to emerge grain sorghum uh, containing the Inzen herbicide tolerance trait. You should spray before the crop is uh, taller than 20 inches. Crop should be between 4 and 20 inches for the herbicide application and weeds should also be uh, small, okay? You don't want to spray to tall weeds because uh, it's not going to be uh, very effective, okay? Uh, the herbicide can also be sprayed with other, uh, with other herbicides out there, insecticides and or fungicides. However, we recommend you to check uh, the label before, uh, you know, making your decision. What is the status uh, of the Inzen technology? This online, there's an online module that's required to be taken by growers before they can purchase Inzen traded grain sorghum seed, and that information can be found at zas.dupont.com. This is the website here where you can find an online module. Uh, Alta and or Advantum, uh, they will have two Inzen traded hybrids that are gonna be in demonstration plots in 2017, and hopefully they'll be ready for commercial release uh, in 2018. They're hoping this, you know, this hybrids are gonna be ready by 18, growing season, and they're gonna have two different hybrids. They're a medium, uh, early 61 to 63 days to mid bloom, and a medium late 65 to 67 days uh, to mid bloom, okay? Uh, Pioneer is also working uh, in some of this with Enzen Swergum, and they hope to have some for commercial release in 2018. Three different uh, hybrids there. And then DuPont is still awaiting uh, the PNT approval from Canada. So as of now, you can send it to anywhere in the globe uh, but uh, Canada. Some of the concerns uh, regarding this technology, as I mentioned, uh, the trait came from a weed. It was inserted into the crop. The concern now is that once you have the crop with this gene, and you have the weed growing out there, shatter cane growing out there, this gene is gonna flow back into the weed, okay? And that's the concern. Some research that has been done in Dr. John Lindquist's lab at UNL has shown that shatter cane and sorghum on cross grades can be as high as 27% with an average of 16% in the pollen source. So shatter cane is growing at the same time, flowering at the same time as your grain sorghum is, it's pretty much inevitable that you're gonna have gene flow from the crop to the weed. The other concern is the presence of ALS resistant shatter cane. <clears throat> Before the introduction of Roundup Ready crops, shatter cane was a big problematic weed in corn. And the way to manage, you know, the herbicide used, the main herbicides used to manage 
uh, cheddar cane and corn were the ALS herbicides or your accent, okay? So we were using this herbicides for grass control early in the 90s before Roundup Ready crops became available. Uh, we found some cases of resistance uh, back then, and these were the three locations where ALS resisted cheddar cane. Uh, populations were confirmed in corn. A few years later, uh, uh, Roundup Ready corn became available and glyphosate was a very effective tool that we were no longer concerned about ALS resistant cheddar cane. But we recently asked the question, are these resistant populations still out there? So we traveled all over, uh, you know, the southern part of Nebraska, parts of Kansas and parts of Missouri. We collected cheddar cane seeds and we tested for resistance to ALS herbicides. And what we found is that even though it's been a good 20 years or so since we've changed from ALS to glyphosate for, for grass control post-emergence, ALS resistance is still out there, okay? So once selected, uh, this genes or this trait is likely to stay in the population, and this is what we're finding. Why is that important? Well, if you already had problems with ALS resistant shatter cane or some other grasses many, many years ago, uh, and you still have this species present in your property, if you're going to adopt this enzyme sorghum technology, that might not work as well for you because resistance is already present. This is some of the modeling work uh, that we did where we wanted to compare different rotation strategies and see how that could help uh, with postponing resistance evolution. So this is what we were calling here the worst case scenario uh, where we have, where we can adopt NZEN, we have shatter cane. And what we do is that we use NZEN after a year, you know, continuously for, for a 20 year period, okay? So this is year, this is time here on the X axis. On this left y-axis, I have individuals, and they're represented by either plants, okay, the solid black line, or seeds, viable seeds in the seed bank, which is this dashed uh, black line here, okay. And then on my right y-axis, I have the frequency of the resistance allele, and that basically tells you how fast resistance is evolving over time, okay. And that's represented by this red line here. So as we can see, if a producer decides to do NZEN after NZEN after NZEN, uh, gene flow is gonna take place uh, early on uh, because this gene is gonna be in the weed. Uh, you know, the herbicide won't be effective controlling the weed. So only those carrying will be favored. That frequency will increase and suddenly your population will take off, okay? So this is what we're calling the, the worst case scenario. Next question is what happens if you rotate NZEN with conventional sorghum? Okay, is that going to do you anything? And the, the answer for that is no. Uh, when you come back with your conventional sorghum, you have no ways of, select, of controlling shatter cane. So you selected for the resistant individuals in the previous generation. They're going to be putting seeds. Uh, you know, there's no option for controlling them this year. They're going to put more seeds. So the, there's not much of a benefit of rotating in Zen with conventional sorghum. This is where things start getting a little more interesting. You are now rotating in Zen uh, with your soybeans. Okay, you are diversifying your system during your soybean years. You have multiple effective modes of action that can be controlled, uh, that can be used to control shatter cane. Okay, and you gotta take advantage of that. Okay, because if you do that, you're gonna keep these populations at low levels. There is nothing you can do in terms of resistance evolution. Resistance is gonna evolve over time. Uh, you know, you can go away for one year, but when you come back, you keep driving that frequency up. So there's no way to fix in that. However, if you do a good, uh, you know, you use a good herbicide program during alternative years, you can actually keep the population low, and that's going to help uh, you all with management. And here is a situation, you know, like for Western Nebraska and parts of Kansas where the, you know, sorghum wheat fallow rotation established. Now you have two years for controlling shatter cane, you have your fallow and you have your wheat ear to use herbicides other than ALS <clears throat> to control shatter cane. And again, if you take advantage of that, you're gonna be able to keep that population at low levels. You won't be able to fix what happens with resistance. Resistance is still gonna evolve over time. However, you can keep that population at low level and have a situation completely different from what it would have been if you were to use this technology. So the, the take home message here is that rotation, rotation, and rotation is going to be extremely important uh, if you decide to adopt this technology. And that's not only true for this technology, it's true for anything that we do these days when it comes down uh, to weed management. So rotate your crops, uh, rotate your herbicide programs, use multiple effective 
uh, chemistry whenever possible. So the best management practices for the Enzen technology don't plant Enzen in fields known to have ALS resistant Johnson grass, shattered cane, or other grass species. If you already have the problem using this technology, it's not going to help you all. Uh, don't plant sorghum the year following the growing of Enzen sorghum. I just showed you that, you know, doing Enzen sorghum and conventional sorghum the other year, it's not going to be a good strategy because during conventional sorghum years, you have no option for controlling uh, shattered cane that could have inherited the trade from the Enzen crop in the previous year. So just avoid that. Diversify your, strat your rotation strategy. Plant crop rotations that will allow the use of alternative modes of action in the year following Enzen sorghum. You know, in your fallow year, you can use multiple effective modes of action. If you're rotating sorghum with soybeans, and the soybeans are multiple effective herbicides for shattered cane control. So take advantage of those rotational crops. Plant into fields in which emerge weeds have been controlled by tillage or non-selective herbicides such as glyphosate. So going back, you know, shattered cane is going to be emerging at about the time you were planting your sorghum there. If you could delay your planting by a little bit, you would allow some of the shattered cane to come through. You could use glyphosate or something or another burn down herbicide to control that and not having to struggle uh, as much post-emergence or use, you know, or rely too much in the in the nicosuphora and post-emergence manage your weeds in the road ditches fence rows you know reduce the likelihood for crop to eat uh, gene flow use full recommended rate, herbicide rate and proper application time uh, if you wait too long to spray you know your nicosuphora under your zest herbicide that's not going to be an effective strategy uh, for for weed management so spray when the weeds are small and closely monitor the effectiveness of herbicide programs. If you see that you're, if you're sprayed and you have a few surviving plants or weeds out there, don't let them flower. You know, make sure you go out there and eliminate those, those plants. So I really like this picture here. Uh, I have winter wheat on one side and I have field peas on the other side. Field peas here is taken by mare's tail and the winter wheat field is pretty much uh, clear. Okay, so this is a closer view of that field pea. So diversity is important, okay? Uh, we're oftentimes say, well, problem is coming from, from our neighbors. Here you have two neighboring properties, okay? What's, what's the difference here is the crop and probably the herbicide program uh, used, okay? So whatever you're doing in your farm matters. You know, I know having a neighbor with weed problems, it's a problem because you may have an influx of seeds coming from your neighbors. However, focus on what happens in your property, you know, use diversified uh, programs because it is possible uh, to keep these weeds under control. This, I just recently came back from Brazil. Uh, I was there, I had a chance to spend some days visiting soybean, uh, corn, and cotton producers. Uh, herbicide resistance is indeed a problem uh, down there. And this is a soybean field infested with mare's tail. So as you can see, your situation down there is not much different than what we see in parts of Nebraska. However, what really got my attention is that some of the producers, they are indeed adopting the zero tolerance program. Some of these guys, they came uh, to the southern USA to visit cotton production and they got really scared of what's happening with Palmer Amaran down south. Okay, so they brought the zero tolerance concept back home. And what they do here, they spray the field edges. Uh, they don't let weeds produce seeds. Okay, so they keep the weeds under control. Uh, here's just an example showing that all the the weeds on the, the roadsides here or the field edges are dead, okay? No opportunities for them to flower. And they oftentimes they send crews out there uh, to get rid of the scape. So in, in this case here, they were going after, uh, you know, uh, Canada flea bane that's in, that has involved resistance to glyphosate. So they basically pull those plants and they don't let them seed because they're concerned. Uh, they understand uh, that, you know, adopting a zero tolerance program might cost you more down cost you more now however it's going to solve you know help you keep this problem hopefully under control down the road okay so it's kind of a long-term uh, investment so with that uh, I just would like to thank you for uh, for your question I have my contact information here mine and Cody so if you're on Twitter make sure you follow us on Twitter at UNL crop insist or at Nebraska dryland crops uh, our email is here in case you would like to get a, a hold of us or you know or check Crop Watch because we're constantly posting information on cropwatch.unl.u. So with that, uh, I just want to thank you for your attention.